If you are alive, you need to know this. God wants to use you to further His kingdom. He has a plan for your life. But so often when someone loses someone that they love, they kind of forget that they still have a purpose here on this earth. Today we're going to see this as Sarah, Abraham's wife, dies. And we're going to see how he responds because how he responds is how we should respond. Join us today. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Genesis series. Very, very glad that you're joining us today. Um, I want to start today with something that happened this summer, so you kind of get an idea of what we're going to be talking about. Um, when Rob and I were on vacation this summer, we were at a hotel, and at the hotel there was this wedding going on. Now, our room that we were at was right by where they were taking pictures of the wedding party and the, the bride and the groom and, and their dog, apparently. But as we watched this wedding party, it dawned on us like how young everyone looked. So what I wanted to do was see like what this actual wedding looked like. So I, I, I went out of our room and I was in like sweatpants, t-shirt, hair pulled up. And, and I was walking by all these girls that were in the wedding and, and they were, you know, they were beautiful and they had these beautiful bodies and these beautiful dresses on. And suddenly I felt really, really old, okay? So I came back and I told Rob, I said, isn't it weird that all of a sudden we just kind of aren't young anymore? Like, when did that happen? Because I don't really remember it happening. But this is what we're going to learn today. And this is what we all know. And is this, that, that life goes on. It just does. It never stops. Life is filled with seasons, different seasons. And Solomon said it best in Ecclesiastes verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. He says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time for everything. And as we move through Genesis, we see that, that, that we've seen with all of our characters, there was a time to be born. There was a time to laugh. There was a, a time when life was just grand and, and there was a time to dance, but we realize that there's a time to mourn and there's a time to die as we're gonna see today. This made me laugh. There's a story told of three friends who are hanging out one day and their conversation turned to the issue of death. One of the friends asked, what would you like people to say about you at your funeral? Well, the first friend said, well, I would want people to say, well, he was a great humanitarian. You know, uh, he, he cared about his community. The second man replied, I would want people to say, well, he was a great father. He was a great husband. He was a great example for many to follow. The third friend quickly said, well, I would want people to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> because a lot of times people just don't want to die. I get that, okay? But today we're going to see something different. We're going to see the death of a princess, Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now, Sarah's original name meant contentious, so she was kind of like that at the beginning. I kind of feel like she was like that a lot of her life. But God changed her, her name to Sarah, spelled differently, and it meant princess. Because through her son Isaac, she would be the mother, basically, of this lineage of Jesus himself, the King of Kings. But working our way through Genesis, we've seen that, that time really does march on. We're going to see that, that Isaac, their son, grows up. Isaac has to have a family of his own. And, and we're going to see this over as we continue on through Genesis. And just like the circle of life, you know, Abraham will die, just like Sarah's going to die today. And, and, then, and then Isaac will die, and then Jacob will die. It just, it's just the way that this works. And that sounds morbid a little bit. 
but it actually isn't. It's just the way that God created our bodies and life to work. So the question that we want to ask today is this, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Are you doing something to make it count? And I don't even mean making lots of money and getting your kids in the best Ivy League schools. I'm not even talking about having big, you know, houses and nice fancy cars. But, but is your life counting spiritually? Are you making it count for what really matters, which is Jesus, seeking his kingdom first? We're doing this read through the Bible and a year discipleship group. And, and this summer, Rob and I were sitting and, and we were talking and, and he said, what are you learning through this? And at the time, I said, you know what's weird is I'm seeing people like, like Abraham and Sarah. And I see this, they're just a little blip on the 5,000 year historical timeline. They're just this teeny tiny little piece of this. When you look back over history, they're just, they're just like this little blip on a screen. And I don't care if they lived 100 years, 175 years, 300 years, you know, a thousand. It doesn't matter. They're just still this teeny tiny little blip. But here's what I told Rob. I said, but they each had a part in this grand story. A, a small part, but a part. And the reason why is because they made their life count spiritually. And as I would go through all these names, you know, the, the genealogies in Genesis, it struck me that, that most of these people on the page of the Bible, we know nothing about. Th their names made it onto the pages, but we don't know what they were like. And it dawned on me, the same is true for all of us. We are a part of this grand biblical story. Even if people never remember our name, we have a part. We have one life, and the question is, what are you living for? What am I living for? Are, are we living to promote us, to promote me, for our short time that we live on earth? Or are we here to promote Jesus, that will actually affect someone's life for all eternity? Because remember this, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. And he did that so he could save us for all eternity. But he did that so we could have a relationship with God once again. And when you and I get that, when, when it suddenly all comes together and makes sense, we, we surrender our life to him. And it changes us. It changes everything about our life. It changes our perspective. It changes how we think about things. It changes what we do in our life. And we realize now that we are a part of that grand epic story that God has on the pages of scripture all the way to the end of Revelation. And now we get to do something eternally important that is tell somebody else about Jesus so that it can change their eternal destination. And here you go, that's the most important character we can play in the story. Because a character who shares the only hope for a good ending to this story on their, in their time on earth, that's the character that we want to be. I saw this the other night with our daughter Cheyenne. Uh, we have a guy that works with us and he is actually, he lives in Florida. Well, the big hurricane was there last week and I, I don't know why I wasn't really paying attention to it. But Cheyenne texted me at night and she said, Mom, Klaus is the guy's name. He said, Klaus, Klaus is, um, I guess everything went out. Cell phones, phones, internet, like everything went out. But for some weird reason, because we have an international business, they, they WeChat. And so somehow he was able to WeChat Cheyenne and, and tell her what was going on. And he was terrified. He lived by a lake that was getting ready to breach. Uh, he said, if it does, it's wiping out our entire complex. Um, he was, says, all I'm doing is, is mopping up water. There's water coming in. There was like a category seven wind gust that came through there. And he was so afraid. He said, I don't know if I'm going to make it out of here tonight. And it was really interesting because Cheyenne's first thought was, I have to tell him about Jesus. And she did. She wrote him and she said, Klaus, I want to know if you know Jesus, because if you don't, you need to start praying. 
because there is more to life than what's just here on this earth. There is an eternity and you need to know him. And it was so funny. He, he kept ignoring her and ignoring her. And finally he said, if I make it through tonight, he said, then I'll start praying more. But it was a start. It was a start. And I was so proud of Cheyenne because I thought, what if he gets saved? And it's all because of a hurricane and, and her just saying something. She has just become a part, a character that, that is played in this grand epic story that God has. It's kind of exciting if you really think about it like that. See, when we die, we shouldn't be looking at our bank accounts or, or, you know, or, or the car we drive or the house we have and think like, well, we've arrived. It, it doesn't really work that way. What matters is asking God, God, did, did I serve your purpose for me in my lifetime? I love this in Acts 13, 36. Um, it says this, for when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep or died. He was buried with his fathers and his body decayed. I, I love that. Our success in life really should be determined by what we've done for Christ. Because the Apostle Paul says this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we're going to see this, that Sarah actually served God's purpose for her in her lifetime because she led him. And we should be letting him do that in our life too. So let's pick up our story from last week and see this time to born, time to die thing. Because the scene shifts from Abraham sac sacrificing Isaac, his son, to a bunch of names. And I was thinking about this last week. I meant to mention this and I forgot, but I was thinking, because I, I, today we're talking about the death of Sarah, but I was like, I wonder if Sarah died of a heart attack when uh, Isaac came home and said, yeah, dad almost killed me today when he put me on that altar. <laughs> but ending chapter 22, we see this. Just a list of names. Uh, verse 20, now it came to pass that after these things, it was told Abraham saying, indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. So suddenly we're going to start seeing some people coming, their names coming in that actually will make sense. But now we're seeing Abraham had a brother. We knew that name Nahor and you know, he's had kids and kid, grandkids and all that stuff. So it goes on to say, Huz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother. And I laughed and I thought, well, you don't see many people naming their boys Huz and Buzz any longer. Um, Kemuel, the father of Aram, and then a whole bunch of names. Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jilpad, Bethuel. Um, and then verse 23, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. Now remember the name Rebekah, because this is, she will be an important part of, of the rest of this grand adventure story here. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. So now you're kind of seeing that there's, there's Abraham's family and then there's, there's his brother Nahor's family. Um, his, verse 24, his concubine, whose name is Ruma, also bore Teba, Gaham, whatever their names are. So it feels like a weird interlude here, but it's really a setting the stage for how Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac, is going to get a wife. And the wife is going to be a relative of Abraham's family. Because Isaac's going to need to have a wife if he's going to have descendants. Because through his descendants will come Jesus. And because of that, we see this name that is going to pop out, Rebecca. This made me laugh. A guy was getting ready to propose. He had a ring in his hand and he, he told his girlfriend, he said, Sweetheart, I love you so much and I, I want you to marry me. But I don't have a car like my friend Johnny Green, and I don't have a yacht like him. I don't have a house his size. I don't even have the money that Johnny Green does, but I love you with all my heart, and I want you to marry me. And she looked into his eyes and she said, I love you too, sweetheart, but before I say yes, could you tell me a little more about Johnny Green? <laughs> so at this point, Isaac is about 37 years old, unmarried, no future wife on the horizon. Maybe at this point, he's just happy to hang out with mom and dad. But God is going to need to do something to move this along. And what's going to happen is his mom, Sarah, is going to die. Let's pick it up in Genesis 23, verse 1. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. This means that Isaac is about 37 years old. Abraham is about 137. 
And, and this is amazing because if Sarah and Abraham got married at around 15, which is probably what they did back then, they've been married 112 years. Now, that's a long time to be married to someone. We know that. Uh, Paul and Amanda were married and Paul stopped wearing his wedding band. She says, why don't you ever wear that ring anymore? And he says, it cuts off my circulation. She goes, I know it's supposed to. <laughs> there you go. But for Sarah and Abraham, they're, they're part in this grand plan. We see that God used them. So much happened in their life. I mean, think about when we first started talking about them. Like God called them. They lived in our, our modern day Iraq, okay, Ur. He called them and, and Sarah went with them willingly. They went to a land they didn't even know they were going. God's like, come to this new land and I will start a new nation from you. Um, we, we've seen them do weird stuff. Like they, they lied to a couple kings along the way. They got caught. They kept moving all around. We see that, that they brought their nephew Lot and, and how Lot left them for the, the bright lights of Sodom. And, and then we saw Sarah and Abraham and what happened after God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They waited for this, this long-awaited baby that God had promised them. In the midst of this, they tried to help God along. Abraham had a son that he shouldn't have had because Sarah gave her maid Hagar for him to sleep with, thinking that's how we're going to get a baby. Sarah dealt with the other woman, the maid, Hagar, and her son for about 15 years. Then she has Isaac, little baby Isaac, the promised son that God has been promising him. And she kicks Hagar and the other son out. So what we see is that for the past 37-ish years, Sarah has taken care of Abraham and their son Isaac. They had a full life together, and now she's gone. Now, the interesting thing is, we don't know how she died. The Bible doesn't say. We only know that she did. Which is a reminder to all of us of this. That, that the day someone is born is not a shock to God, and the day that someone dies is not a shock to God. Look at Psalm 139, 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Look at this verse. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The, the psalmist is writing and says, says all, of, all of your days were ordained. Like you have a number of days for me to live. You, you were there when, you know, my frame was not hidden. You created me in my mother's womb. And then you know exactly when I'm going to die. Acts 17, 26 says this. From one man he made every nation of men. What? That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God knows our number of days. He set a place for us to live. Why? If we're followers of Jesus so that we can get the message of, of salvation out and the good news out to those around us where God has placed us. See, Sarah fulfilled her days. And then she went home to be with the Lord. Verse 2 says this, She died at Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Now, the last we saw um, Abraham and Sarah, they were living in Beersheba. So I'll put a map up here so you can see this. Beersheba is all the way down there to the, to, close to the, to the bottom. But then if you go up a little bit higher, you'll be able to see Hebron. It's sort of over there by the Dead Sea, which I would say the Dead Sea is what's behind us, the pictures behind us. Uh, this, I, if, if I forgot to tell you, every, the, the, that's why we put this screen on the back, because we want you to see this is actually Israel. This is the area that Abraham and Sarah would have lived. So I want you to see that it's, it's desert and it's hot, and, and um, that's, that's why we put that back there. But here's what he says. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Now, what's really amazing is that, is that this is the first time we've ever heard of Abraham weeping or crying in the Bible. Uh, for everything that we've seen from him, we never see him cry or mourn. But Sarah has been a part of his life for over a hundred years, and now she's gone. But we need to understand this. Weeping and mourning are a good thing. It's a part of life. It's how God has created us. When someone dies, people say the goofiest things to them. Hey, don't cry. They're in a better place. 
hey, don't cry. God needed him in heaven more than you need him on earth. And we're like, what? Why would you say that? People say really interesting things. And honestly, I think it's because most people, me included, we have no idea what to say. I don't know how to make it any better. But I like this illustration. There was a mom who sent her son to the corner to buy a loaf of bread. It took him a long time. He was gone longer than he should have been gone. So he finally comes home and his mom says, where have you been? I've been worried sick about you. He said, well, there was a little boy with a broken tricycle and he was crying. He said, so I stopped to help him. And the mom said, well, I didn't know you could fix tricycles. And the boy said, I can't. So I just stood there and I cried with him. And I thought, that's beautiful. You don't have to be good with words. Just be there to share someone's grief by just being there. Cry with them. That's sometimes that's the best thing we can do. But mourning is a, a, a unique process because there actually isn't a mourning period. Each per se person seems to be different. But the Bible actually gives only a specific number of days for someone to be able to mourn. It's kind of fascinating. And it's not like years, like you could mourn for three years over that person. It's days. The Bible's like you can mourn for a few days and then you need to get back to life. It's really interesting. So there might be kind of a lesson for that in there. Gotquestions.org says this about this. In Deuteronomy 34, 8, we're told that the Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning were over. They, they grieved for Moses 30 days. Now, the normal mourning period for a Jewish person uh, in the Jewish culture was seven days. Look at Jacob, 50, uh, Jacob Genesis 50, verse 10. Um, when they reached the threshing floor of Atad near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly, and there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. Now, if, there's a, if it's a well-known, great person, a longer period would, would be when Aaron died, his mourning lasted, you know, 30 days. We see that in Numbers 20, 29. It's uncertain what specific mourning practices were in place at the time Moses died, but Judaism includes elaborate practices of mourning the loss of a loved one. Jewish mourning periods have traditionally included the practice of the rending or tearing one's garments, an act called korea. A Jewish law requires a person to be buried the same day as his or her death, and then a seven-day mourning period commences. A special meal of condolence is provided after the burial. Mourners remain in the house, mourning with friends and family throughout the week. Prayers are offered. Readings from the Torah are shared. Memorial candles are often lit. Traditional grooming stops, as do marital relations, entertainment, and regular study. In some cases, mourners wait 30 days before cutting their hair. The Jewish mourning period traditionally featured professional mourners who would play instruments and chant dirges. Rabbinical rules allowed for even the poorest person to have at least two flute players provided, along with one mourning woman. Woman, When Jesus came to the home of the synagogue ruler whose daughter had just died, he found much more than the minimum number of mourners. There was a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. Mourning sometimes included shaving one's head or putting ashes or dust on the head in addition to rending garments. These actions communicated to everyone that the person was in a mourning period. I don't know if I should tell you this joke or not. <laughs> I, I literally put it in the lesson and then I took it out of the lesson and then I put it back in and I wasn't really sure if it was funny or if it wasn't funny. So... Um, I'm going to tell it to you anyway, and you'll have to determine that. But there was a, um, a man who placed some flowers. He went to place some flowers on his, uh, the grave of his dearly departed mother. And he started back to the, his car when he saw this man, and he was, the man was just overcome with grief. And he was crying, he was wailing, and he kept saying, Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? And the first man approached him, he's like, sir, I'm so sorry, your grief is so bad. Like, who in the world are you grieving so deeply for? And he goes, well, the man collected himself and said, I'm grieving for my, my wife's first husband because now I'm stuck with her. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how come I found that kind of funny. But here's the deal. Mourning is a part of life, but as a follower of Jesus, we're supposed to mourn differently. 
1 Thessalonians 4.13 says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know uh, what will happen to the believers who have died. So what? So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. See, as followers of Jesus, we have hope. We have hope for an eternity that when we die, we just step right into eternity where there will be no sadness and no tears and no sickness and no anything bad. See, we have that hope that we're going to spend eternity with, with those that we love if they were followers of Jesus. See, this earth isn't the end. When we step into eternity, it's so much better. Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, um, the author of Purpose Driven Life, most of you know, know him, uh, they went through a devastating loss when their son, their 27-year-old son, who, who struggled with depression and mental illness, he took his own life. And about a year after this tragedy, Rick said, I I'm asked all the time, how have you made it? How, how have you kept going in your pain? And he says, I often reply this, the answer is in Easter. He says this, you see the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus happened over three days. Friday was the day of suffering and pain and agony. Saturday was the day of doubt and confusion and misery. But Easter, that Sunday, was the day of hope and joy and victory. Here's the fact of life. He says, you will face these three days over and over and over in your lifetime. And when you do, you'll find yourself asking, as I did, three fundamental questions. Number one, what do I do in my days of pain? Two, how do I get through my days of doubt and confusion? And three, how do I get to the days of joy and victory? The answer is Easter. The answer is Easter. Because we have hope. That, that the sadness and the confusion and the misery and the, the questions and the doubt, that they're all going to go away. And we will get to spend eternity where we don't have anything bad in our life any longer. Abraham must have understood this. He understood this, that we have to eventually move on. Verse 3 says this, Then Abraham rose. He, he left Sarah's side knowing he couldn't stay there forever. And the first thing he had to do was find a burial site for her. Because remember, Abraham's kind of a nomad. He's going between Hebron and Beersheba. And he's just, he, he doesn't have like a home base. And he didn't really own any property. So he needed a place, kind of like we have cemeteries. He needed a place to, to uh, like a burial site for, for his family. But in that culture, if someone died, what they would do is they would usually send them back to like, to, to their homeland maybe Ur or Iraq, maybe Haran. Like, we don't really know exactly where he would have sent her, but he, he doesn't do that. He's like, I'm not doing that. That's the past. That's where I used to live. But he wants to bury her in this land that God had promised, this land of his future, his future descendants. In a sense, Abraham is telling people, I'm putting a stake in the ground. This is the, the land that God has promised my people, my descendants. I'm not, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to where it was before. And I kind of think there's a lesson in there for us. Sometimes we put so much stake in the past, the way things used to be, when that person who died used to be with us, uh, the things that, that used to be, and, and, and we just can't seem to get past it. But God calls us to look towards the future. What's up ahead? Stop looking in the rearview mirror. Ecclesiastes 7.10 says this, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise to ask such a question. Warren Wearsby says, you do not move ahead by constantly looking behind you. We don't do that. The past is a rudder to guide you not an anchor to drag you. We must learn from the past, but not live in the past. We have to move on to the new thing that God has for us. Verse 3 says this, Then Abraham rose from beside his wife, his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites and said, I am an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. What's interesting is that, that Abraham is 137 years old and he felt like an alien and a stranger in this land, even though he'd been in the land for over 40, 50 years. 
And yet, what we read is that he felt like this land wasn't really his home. I love what Hebrews 11 says this. Verse 8, he says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. We know that is the land of Canaan, Israel. And he went out, not knowing where he was going, but by faith. He dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, his son, and his grandson, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why? For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham lived on this earth, here you go, with an eternal perspective. Now, we can live with an eternal perspective and still do what we have to do, like raise a family, do laundry, go to work, all those things. But he had this faith that even though he did all those things, that there was more to this world than actually this world. He really honestly believed God when he said that this world would be blessed through his descendants. He didn't really understand it. We do, looking back, we can see that his descendants would produce Jesus, which would give us salvation. But he trusted God for it. Hebrews 11.13 says this, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed them that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Abraham felt like a stranger on this earth. And in a weird sense, I started thinking, that's kind of how we should feel too. Because as we start growing in our faith and we start reading the Bible and we start seeing, oh wait, we have a different purpose here than most everybody else. What happens is we start thinking different. We have a different perspective on life. We should be acting different. We should like not want to go to places that maybe we used to go to, or maybe we should stop watching things that we used to watch. And we start beginning to feel like, like, like this logo, this, this company brand, and I love it. Not of this world. We start thinking like, I don't feel part of this world. I kind of feel not of this world. Because suddenly we don't think like everyone else. We don't think like the people, you know, they're living in the culture, the, the media, the nothing. So we start looking at this around at this earth and we're like, this really is not our home. But here's what we need to remember. We need to be in the world not of the world, sent to the world. See, that's our job as followers of Jesus. We're not supposed to live like the world, but we're sent to the world to tell people about salvation through Jesus. A young girl who recently became a Christian uh, asked Charles Spurgeon at this particular time in, in his life and her life, now that I became a Christian, what friends do I have to give up? And he looked at her and he said, you do not have to give up any of your friends, but know this, they will give up on you. And, and, and I got that. We have friends that when we started getting serious about our faith, they don't want to be friends with us anymore because we start thinking differently. We feel like fish swimming upstream against what the world has to offer. And people don't really call or invite us over anymore. So I want you to know that that actually is pretty normal. So Abraham is asked to purchase this lot that has a cave to bury Sarah. Verse 5, the Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You're a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse his tomb for burying your dead. Seems like, nice. Hey, come. Just, we'll give you a tomb. But that isn't what Abraham wanted. He wanted a permanent burial ground for he and his family, his wife and his kids but he wants no strings attached. He, he didn't want to feel like he owed anyone anything. So kindly he responds with a whole lot of respect because remember, he's kind of a nomad. It's not like this is his area. Verse seven says this, then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, if you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar on my behalf. So he will sell me the cave of Machpelah, which belongs to him. And this is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. 
Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people and, and, and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all Hittites who had come to the gate. Because remember at the city gates was where people would you know, do contracts and there's always people there, uh, officials from the city so that they can, you know, sign off on it or whatever they did. Verse 11 says, No, my Lord, he said, listen to me, I give you the field and I give you the cave that's in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. But Abraham would not give in. I was going to say he wouldn't cave, but that's, that kind of made me laugh. But again, verse 12 says this. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in their hearing, Listen to me, if you will. I will pay the price of the field. Accept it from me so I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. But what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Now, we don't know if 400 shekels of silver is a good deal or a bad deal. But Abraham's not about to haggle. Whatever the cost, he's willing to pay. He wants that land to bury his family. Verse 16, Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and, and weighed out for him the price he is named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight current among the merchants. So Ephron's field in Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders, all the field, were deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterwards, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. Now, in class, we're going to show a video. Uh, I can't do it on this particular video. So if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, below the YouTube video, I will put a link to this. And it's so cool. It actually shows you like where Sarah is is buried. Um, they built a big monument thing over it. So, so you can watch that. I'll put the link down there. But it's kind of amazing when you see that, that what we're reading about, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, there's, there's actually a place there in the Bible at the exact place that the Bible says. So, so Sarah dies and Abraham buries her, but here's what we need to know. We, we have to eventually move on. We just have to. Skip Isaac was talking about this when his brother died, and he said his mom could never get over it. Like for years and years and years, she just could not get past this. And finally, one of the family members had to go sit down with her and say, look, this is not good for you or anyone else. Grief cannot keep us from doing and living life. The world doesn't stop, even though it feels like it should. I had a friend of ours that lost a baby, and I, I remember her thinking like, how is the world still working? Why are people driving to work? And why are, my baby just died. And some of you feel that way, and I get that. But here's what we need to know. Our grief cannot become a long-term excuse to not live or love. It's not an excuse to not love God or those around us or neglect what God has called us to do. I love what John Piper says. He says this, occasionally weep deeply over the life you hoped you would be, hoped would be. Grieve the losses, then wash your face and trust God and embrace the life you have. Abraham mourns, but then he gets on with life. Because here's what we need to know. God was not done with him yet. Abraham is going to live another 38 years, and guess what? He's going to get married again, and he's going to have six more kids. Now, I want to kind of talk about that for a minute while we're here. Because I want us to be able to give people who have lost a spouse the freedom to move on and remarry. But a lot of times we don't do that. We kind of feel like, especially if it's like maybe your mom died and your dad's going to get remarried, your dad died and your mom's going to get remarried, and there's been a lot of time for them to make this decision. But sometimes we hold this grudge, like we think, well, well they shouldn't do that. We think this person, you, you know, you should like mourn for this person forever. But after 112 years of marriage, Abraham moves on and finds a new wife and has a brand new set of kids. And I don't know why that just feels kind of weird to us, but we see this in the Bible that this, that Abraham, this man of faith, did just that. 
we had a pastor friend of ours, um, and he, we hung out with him and his wife a lot, and she ended up getting cancer. She eventually died. And um, God brings this woman into our friend's life really pretty quickly after that. Uh, he didn't know this woman before. He didn't even know anything about her. But like I said, he was a pastor and, and you know, he was at a church meeting one day and he meets her and, and he wasn't looking. But within a short amount of time, he decides, let's get married. But you can imagine the uproar and the gossip at this church. How could he do that? Did he not love his first wife enough? Wow, he got over her pretty fast, didn't he? And we can judge people without knowing anything about them. So here's a couple things that I'm hoping that we can learn from this section. Is this, some people are better married. They are. Maybe, maybe the marriage they had with their spouse was like amazing. And they're used to having someone to do life with. They love companionship. So why would God not want that for someone? See, some people think, well, if I, if I, if I marry someone else, then I'm going to hurt my spouse who's dead. If I get remarried, they're going to know about it. Some people romanticize that and think that, you know, they were soulmates and they're going to be soulmates in heaven. That's not true. Jesus says this, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they'll be like angels in heaven. We'll have different bodies. We won't be married. So you can like be married four different times because your spouse keeps dying. It's not like you have to choose, like, oh, which one am I going to love the most? And It doesn't work that way. So we should encourage people to find a new spouse if they want to. Like I said, if you're a child of a parent that's marrying someone else, you should be excited for them. But there's a couple caveats here. One, that both of them are believers, okay? If your, your parent is, is a Christian, then they need to be marrying someone who's a Christian. But so here's, a, here's things before you gotta think about before you get remarried or you know someone who is getting remarried. And the first one is this, marry someone who's truly devoted to Jesus and living for him. The Bible tells us that. Look at 1 Corinthians 7.39. A wife is bound by law as, her husband li- as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes what? Only in the Lord. The Bible makes it clear that as a follower of Jesus, we have to marry someone who is a follower of Jesus. And I am not talking about someone who says, oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I go to church Christmas and Easter. Oh yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. And there's nothing changing in their life. That's not what we're talking about. Especially in your later years, the goal is this, to serve the Lord together. That should be the standard, the absolute standard for remarriage. The second thing is this, first make sure you're going to marry someone who is truly devoted to Christ. The second one's kind of weird, but I think we see it scripturally. Get your estate in order. Make sure that what was yours with your first wife or first husband, who I don't know, we have men watching this too, um, make sure that what was yours with that particular spouse will be passed down to those children. Now, that just might mean you have to spend a few dollars on an attorney. It'll be the best money you ever spent. Because we know a man, I think I talked about him a week or so ago, uh, his wife died and he got married really, really fast to the absolute wrong person. At the time, he was grief-stricken and lonely, and this woman shows up in his life, and, and everything was based off of emotion. And his estate was not in order, and I will tell you what, it is a mess. The new wife wants all the money. And the kids from the original spouse, now they're having to fight for what their mom and their dad together wanted for them. So if I can give you some really good advice, if you're going to get remarried, make sure your will is in order. And make sure that what you have with your original spouse goes to those kids because that was what you and your, your rich first wife actually you know, worked hard for. Um, we actually see this biblically uh, in Genesis 25 when we get there. Abraham gets remarried and, like I said, has six more boys. But look what happens in Genesis 25.1. Abraham takes another wife. Uh, she bore all these children. Okay, I won't even read the names. 
But look what verse 5 says. But Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. It, but he's got Ishmael and he's got all these other kids. Nope. He and Sarah had a child and everything went to that. Rob and I just did this with our, with our attorney because we started thinking like we're getting older now and like if I, if, if I die, I really do want Rob to get remarried. Uh, he always says he would just get a dog and he would name it Lisa. And he says, finally, someone named Lisa would listen to him <laughs> and do what he says. <laughs> huh. But I told him when I said, I said, well, you don't have to worry about me getting remarried. I said, it's taken me 43 years to train you. I'm not doing that again. Okay, so we, we, we joke around about that. But if for some reason one of us dies and God says, I do want you to get remarried, we want to make sure that the things that we've worked hard for our children, the seven children that we have, needs to go to our children and not the new spouse and her kids and her family. So you're going to actually need to get an attorney to spell that out. And that's, that's actually wisdom at work. So now some of you are like, well, that doesn't sound like you're trusting God very much. I'm like, I don't know. We see it all through the Bible. Contracts, covenants. What did, what did Abraham just do? He just paid and made a contract with, with someone for, for a burial site for his family. So I'm pretty sure that God would think that, you know, thinking through ahead of time would be a good thing. Because my friend who her dad, you know, got remarried, man, it's, it's a disaster. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be nice financially to your new spouse's kids or her. Because look at what verse 6 says in uh, Genesis 25, verse 6. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of Peace. He helped his kids. And Abraham made this all happen while he was living. He's like, look, guys, I'm going to give you money. You're going to go to the east. Well, I'm, I'm sending you away. Because I don't want there to be any fighting or arguing when I die over Isaac's inheritance. Because Isaac is this promised child. Abraham knew that Isaac was the sole heir to God's promise of this new nation, this new people group, the Jews, as we know them. So you need to have a plan in place. And three is this. Before you get married, get good counsel from people who knew you and who knew your, new, your first spouse before they died. When our pastor friend decided to get remarried, he found a few friends, us and a couple other people, to meet this new woman. And he wanted to know what we thought before he took that step. That's just wisdom. That's just wise. Look what Proverbs says, Proverbs eleven fourteen: where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, plans go awry. Awry, I wonder if that's a word, or awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they're established. Proverbs 24, 6, for by wise counsel you will wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. There is something about getting people together who know you pretty well. But what we learn from Abraham is that he finished strong. He lived with Sarah to the fullest, trusting God, pointing their son Isaac to a relationship with him. And, and when he gets remarried, he probably never thought his wife would be like, hey, I'm pregnant, but she does six times over. We thought it was funny when Abraham, you know, had Isaac when he was 100 years old. Imagine now, Abraham has a baby, a toddler, a preschooler, a middle, or middle schooler, all in his house, and he's like 140 years old. But I bet this was such a blessing to him. Because remember what God said in Genesis 17, 5. He says, no longer shall you be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And we see this through here. I, I'll put the, a chart up here. You see, you know, Abraham, you know, had his first son Ishmael by, by Hagar, and then through Sarah, Isaac, and then through uh, Keturah, which we'll see the six sons. But through Ishmael, and through Keturah, they're, they're Arab nations. That's just what they are. And then you have this one line that comes Sarah to, to Isaac, and then we'll see Rebecca come on the scene, and then Jacob, and then through all their kids, eventually you'll see Jesus comes on the scene. But here's what I want you to remember. If you lost a spouse, and you are still here because you're watching this, you need to know this, that God is not done with you yet. He still has work for you to do. 
So the question is, how will we live until we die? How are you going to live until the day you die? Because when someone loses a spouse, they have this tendency to want to just quit on life. Someone wrote, and I think this is true, what if your, your, your tombstone said this, died age 65, buried age 95? You just die inside at 65 and you have 30 more years to live and you're just not living any longer. That's not good. Abraham could have done that. His tombstone could have said died age 137, buried age 175. What if he quit living after Sarah died? What if he was so angry and sad and heartbroken that he just quit following God because he was mad at him? What if he stopped seeking God and, and, and just saying, okay, God, I'm here. What do you want from me now? Because remember, if you're still alive, God is not done with you yet. For Abraham, he embraced his life without Sarah. Didn't mean he didn't mourn. Didn't mean he wasn't heartbroken. Didn't mean he wasn't sad. But eventually God gave him a woman who would take him across the finish line in life. This reminded me of the pastor I just told you about who got married. After his wife died, he got remarried. Uh, after they got married, within a short amount of time, he became really ill. And after seven years of marriage, he died. His wife got up at the funeral and said something amazing. She said, I realized shortly after we got married and after Tom got sick, that it would be my job to take him across the finish line. And she did just that. And maybe after Sarah died and he, you know, you know, marries Keturah, his new wife, maybe that's what she did is helped him to make it across the finish line. For some people, like Abraham, it means you just want a new spouse. You want companionships. For others, like Rob, maybe that just means a new dog named Lisa, okay? <laughs> Maybe for some of you, you're like, I don't want to get remarried. I want to put all of my, my efforts into my hobby or uh, my ministry. Whatever that looks like for you, don't stop living. Please don't stop living. If you're lonely, go get involved in serving the Lord somewhere like this man did. Keith Davidson was 94 years old. He lost his beloved wife of 66 years, Evie, to cancer. To overcome his sadness, he was a retired judge. He built a pool in his backyard in, in Morris, Minnesota. And so what he started doing was inviting all of his neighborhood to, to come over and bring their kids and, and let them swim. He hoped that when he built that pool, that the sounds of the water splashing and the children playing would mask the silence that had engulfed the home after Evie died. He said, I had a fairy tale life and after my wife died, that pretty much ended. He said, you get used to having a person there to enjoy, and now this doggone place is so quiet. He says, the pool has been a diversion from that. He said, the 32-foot pool opened in July, and neighborhood children have been lining up to dive in ever since. His only requirement is that a parent, a child's parent or guardian, must be nearby to supervise, which meant he not only could hear the children, but he could spend time with adults and chat with them. Davidson's house had turned into the new neighborhood hangout. I want to end by saying this. Do something. If you are still here, God is not done with you yet. Find a way to serve God. Here's what we need to do. Getting back to living and serving is a way of making our way through grief. Never forget that. Hope that helped today. Have a really good day.